Hi, this is Levi. Before we get into this episode, I wanted to take a quick minute to introduce a few of the other podcasts in the WCF Podcast Network. Tom and Naomi are exploring how we interact in our ecclesial relationships in From the Platform. It's a very in-depth series that is incredibly helpful for understanding and developing compassion and better listening practices. That's From the Platform. Sam Taylor from Cleveland, Ohio, produces weekly devotionals in Pause to Consider. Think uh, Mr. Rogers meets uh, Fireside Chat. I love Sam's humble style and think every episode is fantastic. You can find both of those wherever you get your podcasts or on our website at wcfoundation.org. Now, here's the show. Welcome back to A Little Faith. This is a podcast sponsored by the Williamsburg Christadelphian Foundation. A Little Faith podcast explores both the challenges and hope of living a life of faith. I'm Steve, and I'm here with Joanna Kitchen, a mother of three wonderful boys. Today, we're going to be talking about motherhood and doubt. Joe is going to explore the transition into being a parent and how that can affect one's sense of responsibility and one's faith. And when we doubt, Joe advocates that we really need to be a support network to each other. So talking about motherhood first, what does it mean to be a mother? But I don't know, is is that a good place to start? What does it mean to be a mother? It is a good place to start probably, isn't it? Because it's the transition from being just an individual and responsible to your for yourself and maybe your partner to them being responsible for a life outside of you and that responsibility I think then changes your approach to your faith and your church life because you're thinking what am I going to teach this child in front of me so you've got all the like general oh we've got a baby how do we look out for it how do we care for it how do we get out of the house again and then you have the big spiritual questions of what things do I want to teach it and how am I going to teach this child Hmm. yeah it seems it is a huge responsibility actually I mean if we Mm. I've raised three kids with more my wife has raised three kids with my help Mm. (laughs) because it it is different for the mum compared to the dad because the mum goes through the physical changes of being pregnant and then well here in England at least two weeks later after the birth dad generally goes back to work and you have this maternity leave which you think might be a nice peaceful taking the baby for walks in the park but actually it's really full on you've got to figure out how to feed them you've got to figure out you're coping with sleep deprivation all of this time um, and it can be really tough but it's it's strange because as a church we're told that and maybe not explicitly told, but a lot of the message you receive as a woman is that having children is one of your main aims because it is just, it is what we see most women doing. Um, it's what generally happens when people get married. So then you're in this position that you've got a baby. So like everything has happened that was meant to happen and it's meant to be good, but then actually it might be really hard. I think we just need to pause here because I'm going to sound like I'm moaning a little bit and I'm saying that things are hard. And I'm really conscious that for some people, they might have really struggled with infertility. Hmm. And so I'm maybe saying it's hard having children when this is what they really want. Mm -hmm. Or they might have never met the right person to have a baby with. Mm -hmm. They might have had... um, a baby with health problems mm-hmm. so there are lots of different scenarios that I think we also need to be sensitive to and acknowledge within our churches as well yes right yeah. we tend to say things and make generalizations and not really think about the audience or what the different yeah or that for some people listening to this this might be painful yeah, right. to listen to yeah mm. so going back to mum new baby <laughs> thinking about the spiritual life, I have a really interesting quote. Um, I'm probably going to pronounce her name wrong. Uh, Micah Boyett um, has written a book called Found. And she talks about what it was like when she first had a baby. And I just think it's some really useful words. Um, So she says, in my first year of motherhood, I lost prayer. 
I lost early mornings of quiet, mornings in my pyjamas with a Bible in my lap, mornings where I spoke my mind's chaos into God's ear and let the chaos come back ordered. I lost peace, I lost clarity and certitude. My faith was never perfect before my son was born, but somewhere in that first year, somewhere in my distraction and exhaustion, I lost the spirit life I had known. I blamed myself. And I think that's really powerful because it shows that the things that had given her meaning and purpose in her life and maybe the routines and structure, structures that supported her faith, when they could no longer happen, she found that she was really lost. And that can be really scary and really disorientating. Mm -hmm. And she says that people told her that in time her kids would grow up and then her prayers would return. And you're like, great, how many kids are I going to have? So are we mm -hmm. talking about 10 years later my prayer life is going to come back? Mm -hmm. And that that's really alarming because in the times where things are hard, that's where you need prayer. Right. And that's where you need your faith. So she explores in this book how she began to pray again and the different things she explored along the way. Um, so she followed some of the liturgical practices of praying set prayers at different times. Hmm. As a child, we often pray at meal times, and we say sometimes I think those prayers can be criticised because they're a bit repetitive and they're a bit glib, but actually having some structure in the day or having some time, this is where I remember God, these are the things I say, when everything else can be disorientating, they can be really good things to fall back on. Um, and she also reframes her expectations of prayer. So instead of it being a really quiet, calm time, she learns to pray short prayers, to mm. pray while she's doing other things, and to start to look at her faith as not being so much a quiet solitude, I'm presenting my best self to God, but in the midst of chaos, still looking to Jesus, thinking what would be the best, best path forward, and offering those really quick prayers. So that makes me think of Nehemiah when he's in front of the king and he has a moment where the king says, uh, ask, the king asks him a question and he doesn't have a few days to go away and fast and to think about it. But he just sends that really quick prayer up to God, essentially saying, God, help me here. And then God listens to him and he responds to him and he is able to move forward. So I think that's a really nice illustration of how prayers can be different in different seasons and different parts of our life. Hmm. Like our spirituality can be different in different parts of our life. Hmm. How would spirituality be different in different... Well, I'll just ask the question. I think I we already... You did talk about that. The fact yeah. that you're feeling like, I'm not very spiritual now, but the hmm. point is you're raising this child and you're hmm. interacting with them and you're talking to God. So it's... Yeah. So it's just, it's just different. And it also might be a time that instead of serving other people or serving in your church or your ecclesia, you might be the person who is asking for help and who is receiving help. And actually, you are blessing other people by letting them help you. Uh, but that can be quite a different change of status to accept um, and to settle into. Um, another thing that I became more aware of when I was a mum was how many um, by how many Bible talks I'd sat through where God is referred to as the Father, and we have a load of interesting sporting analogies and probably some building analogies as well. And it really felt to me that the thing with, that was all consuming at the time, which was being a mother, was quite neglected in what I was hearing at church. But then when I did a bit of searching, there's loads of references to God being a mother. I have a favourite one from Isaiah, which is Isaiah 49, verse 15. Um, and God says, can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for a child of her womb? Even these may, may forget, yet I will not forget you. So God is comparing his love for us as much as my love at that time was for the baby that I was breastfeeding day in, day out. And it was just a re it really brought home how powerful God's love was. Um, and there was another one, which was, 
Um, oh yeah, another Isaiah, Isaiah 66 verse 13, um, which, where God says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. Mm. You shall be comforted in, Ju- comforted in Jerusalem. So it's fantastic that we've got looking forward at the kingdom to come. And that then constantly, every single day in my life, I am comforting a sad child who has fallen over or there have been friendship problems or the food was too hot or too cold. It's just that constant relationship building stuff. And then I'm like, oh, this is what God is doing to us. And this comfort that I'm giving to my children, that's what we're then looking forward to in the kingdom as well. So I felt that by... reminding myself this is nothing new this is nothing revolutionary but reminding myself of how god is described in feminine terms was really powerful when that was what i was doing in my day-to-day life Mm -hmm. yeah well yeah my yeah i've stopped thinking of i mean god does present himself as a father yeah because if you had a God yes. in the Old Testament and your God was going to be more powerful than anyone else's yeah. God, you want a God who is a man, a God who's going to carry some armor and he's going to be standing there delivering you from evil. Mm-hmm. So generally, that's the language. And it was a patriarchal society. Right. You, you've got to have a God who is going to stand up to the other ones. So th- there's no alternative, really, for most of the time, God being described as a man. Mm-hmm. But God is a being. Yes. We're not thinking God is a man or a woman at in reality mm, are we? No. no, I don't yeah, I'm really quite sure that God doesn't have a gender, but because we are humans who write down the stories that we know about God, the words we use to describe God tends to be engendered language and it helps us have the lessons. The verses I talked about help me feel connected to God when it's something that's relatable in mm-hmm. language I understand. Right. Yep. Lately I've been doing some thinking about God and what God is more than who God is, who God is, whatever is in the Bible, I guess, but what God is, which you don't really know, except that, um, we are in him. We, we, as Paul says, in him, we live and move and have our being. Well, I used to read that as just kind of, I didn't really think about it. Now I just take it fairly literally that we're swimming in God. It's like, he is, fills this room, but he, not just him, so this whole, he's this incredibly, incredible thing, <laughs> for lack of a, that's a real lack of a better word, but anyway. So, once then we have these kids, and maybe you're in a family setup, we then think we should take them along to church, or the meeting with us, because it would be good to teach them about God, and... Generally, communities are helpful. In order to keep your faith, it is good to have people to discuss it with and to support each other along the way. It can be surprisingly hard taking children to church. It's always at nap time. I feel like I've gone to a couple of different places and even if they change the time on a weekly basis, it would be the wrong time (laughs) for one of the children. So often there's crying children, often there's children who are clingy, um, and then... In the midst of that, there are some real magical moments when a toddler goes and connects with Uncle Ron and just has a little chat and you're like, oh, this is really good. This is excellent. This is why we're here. And then you look around and at church, we are a group not based on a social interest. So there are going to be all sorts of different people there. And... Sometimes our churches are a little bit white and middle class, so that means that people start to feel similar and act in similar ways. And then when we have people come in who do things differently, it's really hard for us to work with that without the knee-jerk reaction of, they're not doing that right, they're doing it wrong. So I think we need to be really sensitive with our families at church and give them options for different ways they can join in, but be willing for them to do things differently. And so for me, in the moment, that means that I am very involved in our Sunday school and our kids club. But I need to remember that not all families want their kids 
to be separate from them on a Sunday morning. Some of them will want them to stay in the service and that's absolutely fine as well. So we need to be giving people, if your children want to come along, we've got some activities on. If you want to keep them with you, that's fine as well. So it's being able to be not judgmental of the different things that are happening. Some kids are gonna come really dressed up, looking smart. Other kids, are probably gonna turn up in fancy dress for the first five years of their lives. And that's lovely, let's let them be their own people. And when whoever makes a comment, because they've not seen this before, we need to be really quick in making sure that whoever is making the comments or doing the muttering is quickly educated on how important it is that these kids come and that they're seen. Because if we don't invite kids into our church, and if we don't keep them in, then our churches and our ecclesias, they're just going to dwindle. They are literally the future. So even if it is uncomfortable and it is difficult, then we need to be working with them. Yes. Uh, yeah, the whole thing of how of what people wear or whatever mm. anymore, I just say, I'm glad they're here. Yes. We have brothers now who preside and exhort in shorts. Yeah. And it's because they don't have the same kind of background or whatever that I did. Mm. I find it, I haven't gotten quite there yet. But it doesn't matter one way or another as far as God's concerned. No. I don't think, yeah, but. personally, I'm a shoes-on sort of person, mm. even if they're flip-flops. But there's a lot of people who come in and they feel comfortable and they slip off their flip-flops in summer. And I just need to curb my, like, everyone should be wearing shoes. Because yeah. <laughs> it doesn't actually matter. And if they feel comfortable and they feel they can do that, then that's lovely and fine. So it's, um, it's being careful of our own reactions as well. So you did say something earlier that introduces the subject, and it is um, if the Bible does say, has comments, has mm. thoughts on parenting that are not necessarily right, what do, what do we do with that? I think we need to go back to the Bible and revisit what it's saying. So, for example, one thing that different families can do differently um, is discipline. So 20, 30 years ago, there was a lot more physical, physical discipline happening. So when people quote the verses in Proverbs, such as Proverbs 13, verse 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Then they read those verses and they thought, ah, this is our justification for smacking. This means that not only is smacking something that maybe I, my parents did with me, so therefore I should do with my children because it's the only way I know to correct them, but actually the Bible is telling me that this is important and right to do as a parent. However, we come back to these verses today and society has moved on and it questions those methods of parenting. And we look back at those verses and think, we think, where are we? Well, we're in Proverbs. And what are Proverbs? They are nuggets of wisdom to inspire thought. They are nuggets that should make us think in our brain and consider our actions. They are also from a really, really long time ago. Mm. If I told you a story or some instructions on child rearing, from the 60s, it tells you to only feed your babies every four hours. There were a lot of really hungry babies in the 60s. So even 50, 60 years ago, parenting advice has massively changed. So if we take some parenting advice <laughs> from Proverbs, literally, then we are going to get it very, very wrong. Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying that this has no value at all today. We can still hold scripture to have high value without taking it literally. So what is the sentiment behind this verse? Well, it's saying that whoever spares the rod hates his son. So it's saying if we, if we think of sparing the rod as discipline, which is mentioned in the second part of the verse. So this is saying whoever doesn't discipline their child hates them and isn't looking after them very well. And I think actually that is the lesson for us. Discipline is really, really important. Loving boundaries are really, really important. But that definitely in 2019 or whenever you're listening to this, this does not involve 
physical punishment. If we step away from the Bible for one moment, if we just think about the logic of it, a small child hits their brother and we say, oh no, you shouldn't do that and give them a whack. It just doesn't logically make sense. They run across a road and we, sh we cross with them and we smack them because they've done something wrong. It's just a way of trying to pay them attention, but they don't actually learn the lessons that we're wanting to give them. Mm -hmm. However, we do want to be disciplining our children well, and that has to come from a place of connection. So it has to come from a place of knowing your child well, of spending decent quality time with them, to know what is going on with them, to know how they're going to respond in certain situations, um, to then lovingly correct them as they do things that are wrong. And they will do things that are wrong over and over again and all of the time. But if we have that connection and that relationship with them first of all, then we are able to show them and teach them the right way. I mean, I'm saying there's a really positive and hopeful way because my eldest child is only eight at the moment. So I might listen to this when they're teenagers and be yeah. like, she had a lot to learn. Yeah. And I'm sure I do have a lot to learn. But I really feel that the principle principles of connection first and loving guidance are really really important compared to punitive parenting mm -hmm. I think what we can actually do within our church as well is be go on and move even further away from physical punishment and move away from shaming our children as well so when they do things wrong we don't need to tell the whole world about it we don't want to make them feel guilty for the rest of their lives for stealing a sweet from downstairs which it's annoying but it's normal childhood behavior <laughs> and this is really important because as a mum or a dad we are going to be our children's first role model of what a godlike figure is like. Mm -hmm. So we are going to be their first, ex we talk about God as a father or as a mother, we are their first experience of what forgiveness will look like, of what grace will look like. And if we are always scaring and shaming our children through things like shouting, through disconnection, then we could be really affecting what their future relationship with God looks like. And there's a load of really interesting resources out there. There's loads of positive parenting stuff. There's the whole brain child. There's loads, lots of different resources. It's a difficult conversation to have because I think we only do better when we know better. So if you are listening to this and you are someone who does smack or hit their children and and you're feeling bad about this, well, that's your trigger to change and to do something about it. But if you haven't ever considered there are different options or your life experiences haven't brought you to that place, then don't beat yourself up about it. Mm. But it's just time to move on. I have people say to me, oh, well, I was hit as a child. It didn't do me any harm. Right. And I can understand that your kid's fine. And that's it. So it's all right. But I just want our expectations for parenting to be so much higher than we didn't cause them any harm. I want to be like, oh, as a parent, I managed to install all these great values and they built this great relationship. I don't want to be like... I didn't cause them any harm. <laughs> it's just, we can do better than that. And I think we can support each other within our ecclesias and our churches to make sure that our theology, that the lessons we get from the Bible don't impact our lives in a really negative way. Mm -hmm. I would think we need to make sure that our theology is not damaging when it comes to everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, how is it that you, how do you feel about our community since having kids? Well, it's definitely made me care a lot more about our community because I am choosing to take my kids along to King's Youth Ecclesia at the moment and I am trying to tell them that this is a good thing to do and a good thing to be part of. So, that makes it really important that their Sunday school curriculum is good that it is comprehensive and that it is taught in an engaging manner. And it then makes me think to the future that I want them to grow up and have the possibility 
if they want to, of joining a community that is still alive, <laughs> that still exists, mm. um, and that still has something important to say about God and the Bible. Yeah, so there are certain things that I, as an adult, can tolerate within our community and put up with and be like, well, I know it's annoying, but auntie so-and-so likes it, so we're just going to let it slide. But then for my kids, I am not prepared to tolerate those things. So actually, it's made me... Um, push for a certain change to happen it's made me realize that I cannot just wait for this change to slowly happen mm -hmm. because if I wait 10 years then my eldest will be 18 and he will be leaving home so anything that I feel and I hope the things I feel are informed by my bible reading and my morals and the people around me so I don't think these are just random thoughts that pop into my head but I hope that the things that I feel are important they basically need to be there now or in the next year or so because otherwise I am going to struggle to explain to my children why we go to church so one of these things is to do with outreach I think generally as church groups we can easily turn quite inward looking, we can look after each other really nicely, we can give talks every Sunday, nice services and things, but are we looking out into the community or not? And it doesn't take that much to change it. Um, and this is definitely not a criticism of King's Heath. Going to King's Heath has been an education to me in terms of how we are able to do outreach, but it's getting the kids involved as well if it's... Um, so this Christmas, we did some fundraising for a local women's aid and we got backpacks, which the Christelphine Outreach Group supported us with. And then we filled them and we took them along to the refuge. So the kids made labels. I think they saw what we were doing. They were actually involved in it. And it's something that we were doing as a church. So it's only a little thing. And I'm open to other ideas. We can improve on that. But it was a start and it's change in a direction that I hope my kids see as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, music is one as well. So I'm not particularly musical, mm -hmm. but the hymns were ancient when I was a child. And so for my children, I need music to be in a language that they understand, preferably all on a PowerPoint so they can just all see it and have something that is at least, a, you know, within the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, and if people care about music, I feel we just need to be saying yes to them for the change and supporting that that needs to be happening. Mm -hmm. You know, music expresses our, it's supposed to express our joy. Yeah. Well, it expresses other things too, but largely joy at the resurrection, joy at uh, having uh, um, joy for all the good positive things. But yeah. if it doesn't do that because it's played so slowly and it's whatever yeah then, yeah and, and so that. being a parent that perspective I, I listen to what you're saying and I'm like yes absolutely I agree so how do we make those changes to happen mm -hmm. and how do we bring people alongside with us when we're doing them do we need to be doing song practice so actually everyone knows the new songs and they don't feel alien um do we make a cd and give it out to everyone in the meeting cd what am i talking about a spotify playlist you know <laughs> what do we need yeah. to do to bring everyone alongside when when some of these changes and things are happening mm -hmm. because our ecclesia, our church is really a really important part of our family life. And I want our children to feel welcome and involved. Mm -hmm. Yep. That. That's my mission with my Sunday school class, which is my two, I should know their ages, but anyway, <laughs> they're like 10. Okay. Or 11. Mm -hmm. The boys are 13 to 14. So the, yeah, 10 to 11. Mm the girls and then other kids like that so i have six kids that age okay we do a newscast and uh that's what we do because i do yeah. a video so we yeah. painted the classroom green to a green screen Brilliant. and then bought a whole bunch of costumes and have yeah. them there and wigs on the heads whatever and so you just it's called Bob books of the bible news so the basic mm. idea was learn what's in a book of the Bible, at least one thing. Yeah. You know, so then they act stuff out. Or we do interviews. And so if you're talking to 
that was really good. Someone in, with yeah, a cube on there that yeah. says Bob News, and they make it all up. They're really and then amazing. They're able to look back and see the different things that they've done as well. Yeah, presumably, if I yeah. get them on Vimeo. If you haven't gave them it. And they do say, if you are able to verbalise something you've learnt, then you've learnt it really well. Mm. I'm sure there's some percentages mm. in it, but that is a real sign that they've actually learnt something if they're able then to mm-hmm. present it. Okay, they're just so them. funny. They're yeah. just hilarious to be with. It's really lovely. I think we talk about... Um, having to teach or having to look after the children but we forget actually and I don't think I've mentioned it enough today how much joy and inspiration we can get from being with the kids because oh, yeah. their their questions their open-mindedness their ability to take the small nuggets of information you get and then turn it into this fantastic um, resource or whatever they're doing yeah. and they they can be great to hang out with to learn when yes. you learn stuff as well it's just yeah it's really exciting they are okay what's next uh doubt yeah i basically just want to say it's okay and it reassures us that we're not brainwashed but when you do okay. have doubt it's good to have some places in mind to go to some people to be able to talk it through um and not all questions need answers yeah, not all questions need answers. That's good to to focus on if you can. <laughs> this podcast is called A Little Faith. It what is. about the times when you really feel that your faith is very, very little because the doubts pile up? Well, yeah, that's very true. That's sort of the point of this is that mm. you just need, you know, faith as a grain of mustard seed or something supposedly yeah. grows into something much bigger but so we expect that when we get baptized little little grain of mustard seed of faith is maybe small bush size and then we kind of, I, I kind of thought that what was going to happen as i got older it would just get bigger and bigger and bigger and my roots would grow deeper and i would be really nice and secure and i'm able to weather some storms whereas in reality there was probably a period of time after my baptism where everything is going swimmingly and I felt that I was learning lots and growing in the truth uh, to use that great expression but then the same doubts would come back time and time again and I would feel that I had maybe dealt with that question or got some good principles Um, and then six months later another question that would, would pop up and it wasn't dealt with by a quick answer. And mm. I found that then it made me question my identity because if my faith wasn't firm enough to get me through all of these questions or these reoccurring doubts, did, was my faith not a good enough quality? Um, was it not sure enough? But actually, I think that we can learn to carry our doubt with us. I think that we can decide, and it's more of an individual sort of thing rather than a statement of faith sort of thing, what really to us um, is our firm foundation or what are the core things that we think are really important. Mm -hmm. So I find Jesus' resurrection quite a core thing for me I remember going to Israel and walking around some of the places where Jesus had been or some of the places he'd visited and having a real sense of oh these were real places these weren't just like yet another story set in a land far far away but it gave a real sense of um history and Mm. background to some of the stories so some, so I feel that I can allow a fair bit of doubt about an uncertainty about some questions mm-hmm. when I am sure of a particular set of answers. But over time, that firm foundation can change. So, And this is what is meaningful for me, and this is what I am quite sure about. But for other people, it might be something entirely different. And I don't think that's something we can dictate to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something that's good to recognize within ourselves. Yeah, I mean, even late in life, I went through some considerable doubt a couple of years ago or a year mm-hmm. ago or something about. Not so much, I don't know. I find it hard to not believe in a creator and a God and something behind it all, yeah. that it all happened randomly. Purpose. 
Yeah. Yeah. But then the next step was, okay, but really, Jesus, is he real? And that had a little more trouble with thinking it through and, you know, hope the apologetics thing of the resurrection to prove in quotes that. And worked my way back through it all and came out pretty sure that it's true, you know, that yeah. this is... There's something big going on here. It it's is. not just us bumping around in a life that ends and we're done, that, that something is behind it all. Yeah, I take a lot of comfort from the idea of the 12 not particularly well-educated disciples who instead of falling to pieces after Jesus mm -hmm. was died and gone, actually somehow set up a whole movement that has carried on and lasted many centuries later with a fairly cohesive message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still questions about maybe the way the Bible presents the information, but I'm a lot more comfortable this way these days with thinking about um, the idea of the humans are writing down the events that they saw happen. And you and I might go home and have a slightly different feeling about how this evening went because we will have different perspectives on things. Mm -hmm. And instead of feeling a need to look for each little gap and hole and problem, I feel I can take this person's perspective as a whole, also in one of the gospel writers' perspectives as a whole and how it is, and then another one as well, um, and use them to complement each other rather than feeling they've got to slot in exactly. Yeah, yeah, harmony of the gospel stuff. Is, yeah. I used to buy that totally when I was young, much younger, and now it's like it doesn't matter. That's one of the beautiful things of um, misreading scripture through uh, westernized nice. it's is an a good book, book, isn't it? Isn't it? Oh. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's yeah. that makes sense. That's it's, reasonable. But I think even when we feel like we have maybe dealt with a certain issue, it might crop up again in a slightly different form. And I think it's important not to be surprised by that. So one of the things I always come back to um, is, does God answer prayer? What's the point of a God who doesn't make things better to my individual life? I really would like a prosperity gospel. I would like that believing in God, I wish that believing in God and trying to follow him faithfully meant that my life would be easier and healthier and better. And I know it doesn't work like that. So I go back to all of the wisdom literature and Job again, but then something happens and I'm like, but is God going to answer this prayer? Where is God? Where is God in this moment when you really want him? So I think that these doubts are healthy, that they show us that we're not brainwashed, that we are critically evaluating the information and then we re-evaluate it when we have new information. Mm. Um, but it is worrying when it happens. And we need to listen to people when they feel that they're experiencing doubt mm -hmm. and not just give them a quick one-liner answer because we're, I don't think anyone's asked these questions just out of fun. And people's <laughs> not like, oh, I want to destabilise your faith just, just right. because this is interesting. This, people's faith is in, important to them. So... When people have doubt, it is because these are real issues to them and we need to point them in the direction of resources. We need to point them in the direction of people who might be able to help them. But we also just need to sit and listen mm -hmm. and let somebody explore an issue fully mm -hmm. and not be too quick to jump in with a solution. And ourselves not be afraid of God if we're doubting. Yeah. You just don't need to be afraid of God. God comes and finds people in the wilderness, doesn't he? He is there with open arms for the prodigal son. We don't need to be scared of upsetting a right. God or offending a God. Or by even, hard questions. oh, Jesus, a term I don't use anymore, but or trying to avoid Jesus coming back. Mm. I try to express it just for my own benefit, Jesus manifesting himself again, because he's here. Because mm. he's, according to what I've said before, He's in the room. He's part of the oxygen of the room, whatever. 
So he manifests himself again. Um, but what if he does it at the wrong time when I'm doubting and I like, whatever? Yeah. Oh no, no, no! You know. And it's well, just so easy to get into the like I must earn my salvation through yeah. my faith and my works. Right. No, 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 no! <laughs> right, it's a gift. Yeah, he knows our God. It says whatever it is, uh, Psalm one hundred three knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. So wherever we are on this continuum, you know, if you've turned your back entirely, I'm just not going to say never anyway, because who knows? I don't know. We talked about parenting a lot earlier. I'm never going to turn my back on my children. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. And if we inhibit any of those characteristics. I know there are a lot of parents out there who worry and worry about their kids because they're not, they've fallen away or they haven't been baptized yet or whatever. You know what? It's in God's hands, Jesus' hands. It's going to be okay. It really is. And I think, you know, the children of believers anyway. So this is something useful for probably podcast. Um, so when I do have doubts, in particular about our theology, um, I think a little bit about the fruits of the Spirit. So the fruits of the Spirit are patience, love, joy, or gentleness, all the rest of them. So basically saying from good theology, from good stuff, we can see the fruit growing, growing on the tree. So I try and look at our theology and our things that are happening in our churches and think, are they producing good fruit? And if they are, if we are building a sense of community, if we are supporting each other, if we are able to carry out outreach works and charity, if I am being a nicer person and looking after my kids better, then I feel like I can be carried through periods of doubt by looking at the outworkings of what we're doing and being reassured that the fruit at least is good. Therefore, hopefully, what it is coming from is also good. And it's not an arbitrary good or bad. I think it is a sense, I think we have a sense of holiness that we have as humans <laughs> and whether that's some, well, we have a little bit of the divine in us, don't we? Because we have, we are God's breathed which gives us a consciousness which gives us thoughts for all these questions i think we are able to have a sense of judging what is right and what is wrong and then we are also able as we've grown up through childhood reading the bible which also adds to that as well so i think it is fine to look at yet yeah, the fruits of the things that are happening around us and thinking is this coming from a good place or a damaging place mm. Um, one example of that is too much theology that says women should be submissive and silent um, stems to a culture uh, where domestic violence is not fought against mm. and where domestic violence is more likely to happen. I think there was a study in Australia recently. So we do need to be careful and look at the fruit of our teachings. Um, the other thing... I have found more recently is that not all questions need answers. So one of my questions that I think I mentioned earlier um, was, many people have it, is, is God good? Why does God allow suffering to happen? Because I see it happening in the friends and family time and time again. And I could spend a long time thinking about that and studying that. I can go round in circles with many different arguments. Um, I do think the wrestling with it and the journey can be important. I quite like Job, sat down with all his friends for ages and ages and ages and wrestled with it and discussed it. And there is a time and place for that. But maybe this thinking needs to prod me into some action rather than just turning pages. Maybe my doubt and my worry about suffering means that I need to alleviate suffering where I come across it and find it. So I think that the doubts and questions, okay, we have them, let's wrestle with them, but then let's see what we are being prodded to do and what is niggling at us um, that maybe we should be doing something about in our lives. Yeah, that's a good outlook, really. As opposed to just, why, why, why? Go do something yeah, about it. Yeah, 
We're very privileged. I am very privileged. I don't know about I everyone listening. Privileged. I am very, very privileged mm -hmm. in my house with my husband and my relatively stable family life. It means I have got time to ponder all of these questions, um, and that is a luxury. But too much pondering, I think, if it doesn't lead to any change in ourselves and into any action, it's pointless. Yes. And well, that's what it's all about, is changing ourselves. Yeah, more like Jesus, um, more like the good right. examples we see. Right. Yeah. That's what it's, uh, you know, change your thinking. Yeah. Be thinking about other people, don't think about yourself. Yeah. Automatically, because we do, because we're humans. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're interested in our own survival. But there is something very powerful about then considering other people and looking outside, outside of ourselves.